Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here. Been a while since I've done my review. The last one I did was a Peanuts special, What Have We Learned, Charlie Brown, last Sunday, in celebration of its Memorial Day weekend. Figure why not. So I had to take some time to take a break, you know, watch some movies. I posted some commercial breaks that I found online. And I was also in the middle of celebrating my sister's birthday, which we did. So I figured, why not? So I, with that aside, I'm going to do a movie review this week. And it's a fantasy romantic adventure filled with a lot of uh, comedic humor and all. Very whimsical, too called Stardust. It's based on a novel by Neil Gaiman, the same man who gave us Coraline, among others, which follows a story about a young man who is about to propose his girlfriend till suddenly a falling star appears as his wish by going to find that star, which turned out to be a celestial princess. And that's what follows his journey through all these mystical fantasies you know, filled with uh, wicked witches, you know, flying pirates, also a cane which um, led to all these brothers who, who eventually became ghosts. Yeah, very uh, goofy, satirical type of ones. and. Oh no, <laughs> that's what the story had to be about, which often gets compared with The Princess Bride, Time Bandits, and all these other fantasy adventures, but it's supposed to be a fairy tale for adults, so that means that it's not meant for kids in a way, but the way I saw the movie, I, I, I'm pretty certain a kid won't mind. I mean, because it's pretty tame compared to, you know, most. <laughs> but that's basically what you're expecting. <laughs> um, of course, this was co-written and directed by Matthew Bond, who's been best known for joining in with Guy Ritchie with Lockstock and Two Smoking Barrels and Snatch, come to mind. And he later went on to do uh, Kick-Ass, which is a take on superheroes. I saw this movie unexpected um, in 2007. I wasn't so sure about this movie because I love fairy tales. I, I love fantasies and and comedy and all these thrilling adventures that I can deal with. I'm just hoping this was going to be you know one of those movies. I mean, considering that this was made in the 2000s. But it kept me by surprise, and I enjoyed it. Um, love the cast they chose here. You know, they got Robert De Niro, you know, playing Captain Shakespeare. <laughs> you got um, Michelle Pfeiffer, you know, playing a wicked witch named Lambia. And you also got some other actors like Ricky Gervais, Peter O'Toole in a very small role as the king. Um, Claire Danes uh, playing the celestial princess who happens to be the falling star, Yvain. And um, you even got uh, narrator uh, E. McKillen to focus on the story here. But you also got a lot of um, talents that you know went on to do something big, like for example Charlie Cox it was just the real star of the film, <laughs> no doubt, because later on he went on to do the role of Matt Murdock, the blind lawyer, aka Daredevil, in the TV series Daredevil from Netflix. So if it wasn't for this movie, he wouldn't have been well known. So that was the case. Um, so there's like a lot of... Um, you know, wicked, whimsical humor, and all this other 
fantasies with special effects, um, visually done in CGI, but it has some practical stuff in the mix too. But but it was all in all fun. And I got this Blu-ray at Amazon, which this is the Blu-ray I was having trouble finding, hoping that it was going to get here on time. And I'm glad it did, because if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be able to review this. Or even watch it. Because it's been a while. And it does have special features included. Now, there's something different here about this Blu-ray, because, uh, believe it or not, when the movie was released on DVD and HD DVD, yeah, which is a format that's no longer around anymore, not a Blu-ray one, it was, there was a featurette for the making of Stardust, which was called Good Omens. And I think that's where it had all these interviews with the rest of the cast and crew. Unfortunately, though, the Blu-ray did not contain that, and they actually came up with their own uh, making of, of Stardust, which they joined in with Neil Gaiman, and only had a few uh, of the actors, like Claire Danes, Charlie Cox, Mark Strong. Yeah, Mark Strong's another one, too. Um, there's been another stuff, too. He was even in Kick-Ass. Um, as well as um, Matthew Bond and joining in with uh, co-writer Jane Goldman, because they were the ones who wanted to, um, with the supervision of Neil Gaiman, to actually create, basically, Princess Bride meets... Uh, Midnight Run. <laughs> so, anyway, I mean, it, it's a nice um, making of. I mean, they had, it's basically a five-part documentary put together. And it does uh, have deleted scenes with blooper reels and a theatrical trailer. And it even has Nothing is True, which explains about some of the elements that could have been included in the film. That was from the, the novel. Uh, that was the case. Got commentary though with both Bond and Goldman. So the five part documentary is called Crossing the Wall. And that's the only one they got. So I guess I might as well have to find the DVD for that. Maybe I should have bought the DVD <laughs> if I knew there was a, a feature missing. But it's nice to have it on Blu-ray. It looks... Um, incredibly solid. It's it's a movie made in 2007, although they filmed it in 2006. Done digitally with blending in with film. So it should definitely look incredibly pristine. But still, I love it. So let's begin with the review. It stars Claire Danes, who's been best known for the TV series My So-Called Life, and been to several films like uh, To Jillian on her 37th birthday, which also stars Michelle Pfeiffer. I know she was also in the movie Home for the Holidays, uh, William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, uh, Bosch Lushman's version with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. And she went on to do uh, Temple Grinnan for HBO. She played the part. Uh, Charlie Cox, um, as I mentioned, went on to do Daredevil, the TV series. Michelle Pfeiffer, always been uh, best known for other films that she's done in her career, like Grease 2, Scarface, um, The Witches of Eastwick, which is a nod to that, um, as well as Batman Returns, Frankie and Johnny, um, on many others. Mark Strong, who went on to do uh, Kick-Ass, plays a villain in that. Robert De Niro, you know, legendary actor. Taxi Driver, Mean Streets, Waging Bull, Goodfellas, and many others as he's done. <laughs> uh, Jason Fleming, Rupert Everett, um, and I know he's been in other stuff too. He was actually in Dustin Checks In. <laughs> in my best friend's wedding. 
Ricky Gervais uh, from the original The Office, which I know the American version was on with Steve Carell. <laughs> and I know he was in the Night at the Museum movies, among others. And he's always been funny. I love him. Sienna Miller, who went on to do uh, the movie G.I. Joe, Rise of the Cobra, among others in her career. Peter O'Toole, no longer with us, but he's a legendary actor. In a lot of great films, such as Lawrence of Arabia. And I know he was in the movie uh, High Spirits, uh, a very underrated film. Uh, Fantasy adventure. Um, Ian McKillen, of course, from X Men, at Poople, uh, among many others he's done in his career. Kate McGowan, Joanna Scallon, Sarah Alexander, um, Adam Burton, Nathan Neil Parker. Henry Cavill, yes, Henry Cavill, uh, long before he went on to do Man of Steel, plays Clark Kent, a.k.a. Superman. Um, he was also in the movie Immortals, and, of course, plays the villain in Mission Impossible Fallout, recently. Uh, David Kelly, who's, I know, a uh, best known for other films he's been in in his career. I mean, he was in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, um, Waking Ned Divine, uh, among others. Yeah. Mark Williams, uh, George Eans, and Dexter Fletcher. Uh, Based on the novel by Neil Gaiman, it's written by Jane Goldman and Matthew Bond, and it's directed by, once again, Matthew Bond. The movie began set on an English village of Wall, lies a stone wall that borders straight into a magical kingdom of Stonehold, where an older guard, played by David Kelly, prevents everyone from crossing, but Dustin Forn it was played by Ben Barnes and his younger self. It would soon become his older self, played by Nathan Neil Parker, had crossed over the wall and into the wall market. And if you saw the theatrical trailer, although I think it was Tristan that actually jumped over the wall, which I know they had to do some changes too, because that was a deleted scene. We see like a, a clear portal that goes straight into it. And I, I even wonder why they could have used it. Anyway, uh, Dustin meets a, an enslaved princess named Una, played by Kate McGowan, who offers him a glass snowdrop in exchange for a kiss. After he actually helped her, you know, because was, she was all chained up. But nine months later, the wall guard had delivered a baby to Dustin, actually named him Tristan who would soon become 18 years old, very young and handsome, played by Charlie Cox. So, 18 years later, that's where we meet the dying king of Stonehold, played by Peter O'Toole, who throws a ruby up into the sky, decreeing that his successor will be the first of his sons to retrieve it. So that way, they'll be taken over as the new king of Stonehold. But the gem hits a star, they fall together, and the remaining sons, Primus, Septimus, and Tertius, independently search for the now clear gem. And they're all played by Jason Fleming, Mark Strong, and Mark Heap. Yeah, I forgot to mention him. So that's what led to a wall when Tristan sees a, a fallen star and bows the retriever for the objection of his girlfriend, Victoria, played by Sienna Miller, as a proposal to marriage, which led to the jealousy of her boyfriend, um, Humphrey, who's played by Henry Cavill, yeah, because that's what led to a fight. 
So Tristan learns that his mother is beyond the wall, Una, and receives a Babylon candle that she left for him so that way he'll be able to transport him to the location he's going to be at. Um, the fallen star, of course, had eventually became a celestial princess named Yvain, who was played by Claire Danes. Um, and she actually landed right straight into, like, between um, the wall market and the castle of Stonehold. Yeah, it's a very huge castle, as you may find out. Which I know uh, this is what led to all the sons um, of the king, which all the sons have became ghosts in their goofy uh, side of ways. I mean, yes, you see one that's frozen, the other one that's axe, one was burned, and the other one that's already had his face plant. I mean, after being pushed in through the castle by one of the sons, and he fell all the way into his death. Yeah, <laughs> pretty messed up, isn't it? Um, so, anyway, when Tristan uses the candle, it goes directly to the pit where Yvain had landed, and apparently she wasn't getting along with him very well at, at first. Of course, we know that Yvain is a very beautiful woman, and rightfully so. So, after he found out that she was the star, he changes her to bring her to Victoria to show some, some proof here. But then we meet three agent witch sisters of Stonehold that resolves by eating the fallen star's heart to recover their youth and replenish their powers. And that's where we have the leader of the witches, Lambia, who's played by Michelle Pfeiffer, who eats the remains of the earlier star heart, yet using all these um, animals that they had all caged up. Yeah, and then that's what led to cruelty to animals here. That stuff I know, but she sets off to define your vein, you know, using all of her powers. Which, if she uses up way too much, she'll become her older self again, and using all of her youth. Yeah, and that's how it, it goes on for the story. But she did conquer a wayside inn that she just um, created using her magical spell. She turned the goat carrier into a goat, but then having to restore the entire inn, she actually turned this goat into a woman and the other goat into a human man, but acts exactly like a goat. <laughs> Pretty clever. Uraine had became very tired, so Tristan changed her to a tree and promised her to bring some food. But in his absence, um, she spotted a unicorn that releases her, but it really takes her to Lambia's inn. Tristan discovers that Yvain has been gone, but he fell asleep, and somehow the stars whispered to him that she is in danger. That's where we led to this nightmare where the three sisters were about to set off to take her and kill her to take the power and be able to become, you know, their younger selves. So, they tell them to get on the passing coach, which happens to be premise, and, but as they finally went to the inn, they eventually interrupted Lambia's attempt to kill Yvain, and as you saw Yvain, of course, you could tell the shimmers and the shines that's coming from her hair. Um, I guess when she's like smiling, you know, happy, that's where she starts to, to gloom. Uh, therefore, Primus was taking a bath and Lamia just just uh, slashes his neck, kills him. You know, blue blood starts to shoot up and now he's a ghost. But Tristan and Yvain are about to escape from Lambia by using the Babylon candle, which eventually went straight up into the clouds where we meet 
all the pirates that are being captured from a flying ship that led to the leader, Captain Shakespeare, who's played by Robert De Niro. They wound up being friends with them, Tristan and Jervain, which at that point on, you know, that's where he brings in all the charms. I mean, he actually fools uh, the pirates by actually throwing, pretending like he threw um, Tristan out of the window, but it was actually a mannequin, because <laughs> they just have them all trapped. But uh, he actually was delighted by them and just having to show his dressing room, you know, filled with all the, the clothes and stuff and having them, you know, dress up casually and, and beautifully, almost starting to look like, you know, a prince and, and a princess. I mean, you can even see uh, Tristan's hair starts to grow longer even though he was given a haircut. <laughs> So what he does, however, was that he teaches uh, Tristan how to fence and Yvain how to dance. And also teaches him to play music and all, and everything. Um, and while they were on their way, uh, they also met um, a, a buyer from a local shop uh, named Ferdy the Fence, who's played by Ricky Gervais. Yeah, he's very funny. You know, throwing all these bets and they're starting to collect some more um, you know all, a lot of stuff that they have you know even some weaponries and stuff that they need such as the uh, the flash that they got being the last survivor son Septimus had only had to find a stone to become the claim of his throne but he learns that it's in the procession of a falling star and realizes that the hearts of the star will grant immortality. After Tristan and Yvain had left Captain Shakespeare's ship, which led to the chase, I mean, that's where Shakespeare had led the pirates to go attack him as well as his men. Well, and we know how the story goes. Because um, already, you know, Septimus is chasing them along with Lembia and all. Um, Tristan and Yervain had confessed their love for one another, and they'd suddenly spend the night together at a local inn, where a witch named Ditchwasher Sal had came over through a caravan, as he turned Tristan into a mouse, put him in a cage, and that's what led to Yervain's confession with him. And when he turned him back... <laughs> To a mouse. I mean, yes, Yvain actually fed um, Tristan the cheese and all. <laughs> that that's what led to the lesson that had to be learned when Tristan took uh, the lock of her hair, as Yvain um, just glooms and shimmers and shines. He he went back to Victoria, gave her the the lock of her hair which eventually turns into Stardust and tells um, Victoria to actually stay with Humphrey so that way you know he'll be able to go back to his love already with uh, Yvain only to learn that Yvain is actually in trouble because they realize that she will die if she crosses the wall and rushes back to save her um, Una somehow shows up and noticed Yvain walking to her doom. So she came to save her by taking the caravan of uh, Dishwasher Cell to stop her. But then Lambia and Septimus came, actually kills Sal, and captures Una and Yvain, taking them to the witch's castle, joining in with her sisters. And that's what led to the battle when Tristan and Septimus had worked together to stop them. Well, that's what led to all of this going around when Lembia actually uh, kills Septimus by using a voodoo dao, you know, snapping his arm and his leg and then dumping him into the water which then drowns him and soon he will become pretty much a corpse of himself under the control of Lambia by you know, having 
a sword fight between Tristan and him. And of course, he did become a ghost, joining in with the brothers. And already Tristan had let out um, the cages of the wolves and, and all attacking one of the sisters and also um, having them stab another sister. So they're all killed, only leaving Limbia behind, which at this rate was about to spare their lives. But in reality, she tricks them, just having the entire castle shut down. I mean, already shooting up all the glass with her powers. But the only thing to help was with Gervain already being saved by Tristan because, you know, she was about to already getting stabbed by Lambia, going to get killed so that way she can be able to get the power. Um, she uses the power to sacrifice her using that particular glowing shine. Yeah. And vaporize, him, vaporize her completely. So now she's gone. And Tristan and Yvain had embraced themselves. They fell in love, and now they became King the Queen of Stockholm. And they're going to be staying, they're going to be King and Queen forever until as 85 years has passed. And that's where they'll become, you know, stars. You know, that's for their choice. <laughs> so, it's a very um, whimsical wonderful fairy tale um, very fractured and it really um, works all based directly through um, Gaiman's uh, novel which actually was a four issue comic miniseries put together that was actually published by DC Comics under Vertical Comics and I guess yeah joining in with the uh, art illustration Charles Bess. So they put them all together. Uh, Gaiman wasn't intent to use it as a film adaptation, but but when having to be rescued by Bond and and Jane Goldman, I mean, which she had red hair, <laughs> if you saw the interview, um, they're trying to do what they can not to um, try to stay true to the source material as they can and try to add some more you know, fun into it, but have to, having to come up with some changes, which unfortunately they had to change uh, the first half of the draft, which led to the ending. I uh, didn't want it to be as downbeat as it seems. I can see why. Um, now, when I did saw uh, one of the interviews, too, uh, with Neil Gaiman and also the featurettes, he did explain that they could have had like a unicorn fight, which was, I believe, in the book. That he was hoping that that was going to be included in the movie, but that never did, so that was the case. But either way, I, I, I knew they, they tried this hard. Um, but, as it's turned out to be, I mean, I, I really um, enjoy it. It was unexpectedly... It's something I didn't expect it much, but I really love the the look, the feel, the, the fantasy, the the take on pretty much like all fa fairy tales out there. So they really uh, blended in together. I love the cast. Robert De Niro definitely nails his performance. It's not a phony performance. He really nails it perfectly as Captain Shakespeare. Uh, probably the Funniest moment, too, was when he was inside his dressing room, dresses up like a woman, wearing the uh, the Corvette and even painting his mole. And he was, like, dancing around to that tune while Septimus, along with his man, well, Septimus was about to go after him, but the pirates uh, were attacking <laughs> his crew. In that particular sword fight, and, you know. Meanwhile, <laughs> and he was doing his performance. I mean, that that had to be the most funniest scene I've ever saw on film. He really nailed it. 
Uh, I, I would have imagined Jack Nicholson playing that role too, but Bond suggests him, even with the New York accent and all. I mean, of course, he couldn't use a a British accent. Um, but he really was a charmer, and he really nails it. I love it. Uh, Michelle Pfeiffer was just luminously scary as uh, the witch of the leader of the of the witch's sisters, uh, Lambia. Uh, definitely it is a nod to um, the the witches of Eastwick, and it really shows. Except even though she was more beautiful in that film, I mean I can definitely see the similarity with the Budu Dao scene. Um, but she really, um, was just sexy, um, seductive, but she had a lot of, um, uh, fear, um, ferocious in, in, in a way for her performance. It was amazing. Uh, Claire Danes was just beautiful as the fallen star, celestial princess, Yvain. I mean, I love the scenes where she actually glows, glims, and and just the shines with a lot of shimmer in there for her hair. And they didn't get along with uh, Tristan at first, but it just... <laughs> but after a while, I mean, they had their confession and they suddenly fall in love. That's kind of like how it is in, in usual fairy tales. I mean, or it, it could be any other comedy. I know. Uh, of course, the real star is Charlie Cox, you know, playing Tristan. I mean, he was definitely handsome, uh, heroic. I mean, the moments when he's like fencing, he's like an actual prince, and it works. It's basically his journey to follow this particular fantasy adventure when all he wanted was the falling star to give to Victoria, which would led to that. Victoria, of course, played by Sienna Miller. I mean, she's very beautiful. And also elegant as uh, Yvain. But I, I know that's not going to last. Um, of course, um, Humphrey happened to be Victoria's boyfriend, who was actually jealous of, of Tristan. He felt like, you know, he's going to take everything away from him. And played by Henry Cavill, though. And he was a blonde, too. But he sort of resembles to um, a bit like Carrie Elves, in a way, the way I saw him. Um, as for the rest of the cast, I mean, Peter O'Toole gets like a small role as the king. Uh, Ian McKillen is the narrator. Um, Kate McGowan is as beautiful as Una. Also, the mother of Tristan, uh, Nathan Neil Parker as Dustin, who happened to be the father of Tristan. Um, yeah, of course, you got Jason Fleming, Rupert Edward, you know, playing the prince and all, and of course, the brothers and all. <laughs> uh, Ricky Gervais as Ferdy the Fence. I mean, yes, he was hilarious in this movie, too, even though it's a, a relativity small role. I wish he was in the movie more, but that was always the case. Uh, there was a scene in, in the movie when Lumia came in and into his shop and then suddenly tells him to be quiet. That's where she uses the power and, and he talks like a bird, or like a parrot or so, <laughs> before he got stabbed by Septimus, um, who was played by Mark Strong. And Mark Strong, I think he was supposed to be the villain in this movie, if that was the case. But I know Lamia is is the true villain of the film, but I guess that's kind of what led to this sometimes when sometimes, you know, and it, it could be a cliche too, and like sometimes you think this guy's going to be the villain, but then next thing you know he's going to work together with the hero. We've seen that a lot too. <laughs> but... Because he's already going around killing people, too. Just to find Yvain. Um, anyway. Um, 
the script is just superb. I mean, coming from Jane Goldman and Matthew Bond, I mean, they really use a lot of satirical jokes and all of that, and all the stuff that they put with the source material that Gaiman had had a knowledge from. I mean, he's also the producer for the film, joining in with Lorenzo D. Bonaventura, Transformers producer, <laughs> and all. And I know Vaughn is the producer as well for his more films so, company. Um, and um, it had some dazzling special effects. I mean, everything you saw in the movie was spectacular. I mean, it's done practically at times. I mean, with, with the cast and the stunts and all that. But they also had some beautiful, luminous um, special effects that they use. You know, like having to go directly through the, our point of view, straight into the wall, and goes directly to where the princess had landed through the, the fallen star in the sky. And then we get to see the castle, as huge as it is, I mean, and how it goes directly and goes all the way closer to the top, where we get to introduce the characters, uh, such as the king. And... And you wouldn't believe how tall this castle was. And then they even show how big the castle can be. I mean, filling in with all the guests and and the, the crowd around. And everything they use. And then the magic, you know, the powers that uh, Lemia had to use. <laughs> even though she turns old. It's like she's running out of power. Or having to bring the, the end back together. Like it was already burned, so it looked like it was going backwards. Or any of her other powers that she used to turn everyone into others. Or how creepy she looks, too. Or any of these other uh, special effects with the the flying ship, the clouds. I mean, the, the magical spirits and everything they put into it. It's just, it's like a storybook right there come to life. It's very impressive. Uh, wonderful score done by uh, Alain as Curry. It has like that fantasy uh, like score that just really fits the tone very well. Uh, cinematography was done by Ben Davis. I mean, it definitely gives it a closer look. Uh, all shot by uh, the aspect ratio of 2.45. It gives you that uh, wonderful cinematic feel and some nice editing by John Harris. I mean, I know it can be a little cluttered, but he really put all the pieces together as they could. I love the song by Take That. It's a, it's a boy group called uh, World the World, and this is the same group that sang the song back in the 90s uh, called Back for Good. But this was a great, beautiful song. It really works for this film. It's a nice touch. It definitely is a fractured adult fairy tale. But they had to do some changes here and there. I mean, I, I think kids could definitely check this out. I mean... I don't... I mean, yeah, there are some, like, um... There's a, a little bit of nudity in the film. Like, maybe brief, but... Nothing too intimidating, so... But I just think they really did what they can. Um, but I figured that you know they were going to get some other actors to play the part. Like I know they were going to get Sarah Michelle Gellar to play Yvain, but I'm glad she dropped out. I know they were going to get um, hard to believe they were going to get director um, Terry Gilliam to do this, which Matthew Brown was going to produce, but. Unfortunately, he turned it down just so he can do something else. It, which is interesting because he did do The Brothers Grimm. And Terry Gilliam is, is a master. I mean, seeing that he's a veteran for Monty Python. Uh, I, I know Vaughn had, had did the layer cake. And I figured he was also was going to do the next X-Men movie which that turned out to be first class. Um, 
Yeah, he was already doing Kick Ass, which this would be his uh, follow following movie. That was <laughs> a take on superheroes and all, but Mark Strong was also in there. Uh, anyway, uh, the movie only made three hundred and thirty seven million dollars um, for the budget of seventy to eighty eight point five million as I searched around. Um, it wasn't a financial success as they were hoping it would be, but it was indeed uh, modest, so it did very well um, when it came out in the summer, in August. Yeah, I mean, because it was in the middle of other summer blockbusters. But still, I would say this would be a classic, a cult classic, and it would follow. I mean, I I would have loved to see a sequel, but I think the movie looks as looks a lot better as a standalone film. So, hey, Princess Bride didn't have a sequel, so why not this? You know, it's better that way. I mean, the movie was actually shot in uh, Scotland as well as uh, Iceland, I, I believe, and somewhere in the United Kingdom. So they they had to shoot some most of the locations here to capture the spirit. I know half of the area they couldn't even allow animals in, like horses. But they try to do what they can you know, with all the technology they had to make it look like they actually had them. Um, but it's it's definitely, you know, a whimsical fantasy. Totally romant romantic. A lot of satirical humor. You know, definitely has the feel to all these other movies that we've seen. Great cast, all excellent together. Wonderful score. Got some nice narration from Ian McKillen. I, I'm even surprised that was him when I heard him narrating the entire story. But it's perfect. Um, it would have been nice if we had the unicorn uh, scene more often and maybe have a fight scene that. Gaiman actually wanted. I, I would have loved to see that. And I probably would have loved to see some, maybe a few more here, but I understand. You know, they had to do some changes. Uh, one song, which I think it was going to be nominated for the Oscars, but it never did. Yeah, they snubbed it. But still, just superb. <laughs> So that's Stardust, you know, what do you wish for <laughs> when the falling star appears? And I give the movie five stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.